Vittorio Gardolini Treviso. Tube types ECH4, EF9, EBC3, EL3, AZ1. Early 1950s. This is the documentation of the experience of a hobby project available in video and in written form made with the hope that it could be helpful to others. But any comment that could help me to improve my practice is also welcome and appreciated. This radio does not have a brand name because it was made out of ready-made components that were available at its time. Here is an example of some adverts contained in the magazine Lantenna, February 1951. One could find empty chassis, RF modules, dial mechanisms, dial scales, IEF transformers, and so on. Even unbranded radio cabinets were available. It was very much like in the 1990s when it was common practice to buy the components for assembling a personal computer. With the help of the people in the forum Elettroni al Tramonto Elettroni da Salvare, it was possible to determine the type of RF module used and other important details. In particular, this radio uses an RF module that resembles one produced by Jelloso, the number 1903, and a chassis also designed by Jelloso in the 1930s, but for a different set of tubes. The radio was built by Vittorio Gardolini after World War II in Treviso, Italy. Here he appears behind his wife Clara. He made some or a few other radios, but there are no records on them. At that time, Vittorio Gardolini was living and repairing radios in front of Piazza Berci Lati in a building that is attached to St. Thomas Gate. See the appendix if interested in more about Vittorio Gardlini. This radio was owned by my uncle Luigi and my aunt Zafra. Vittorio was the brother-in-law of my aunt. My uncle Luigi once said that he bought the radio with the money that he got by selling a barrel of wine. What we know is that the people who are still alive have always seen it in the house. And I also have seen this radio since I started visiting my uncle and aunt in my childhood. The place is a farmhouse that was always kept very clean, but exposed to dust generated by all the activities happening outside in the large courtyard. The chassis of the radio arrived literally covered by a thick layer of dirt, with the vacuum tubes black instead of showing the original red coating. This is what was the condition under the chassis before the restoration. One might notice the variety of brands and styles of the components ranging from the 1930s to the 1970s. That suggests that the radio was built also reusing components from other dismantled items, and that there has been significant maintenance until the 1970s. Even the screws were all different. Another thing that should be noticed is that the tube sockets were all installed from under the chassis, while that type of tube socket should be installed from above. Later it will be clear that the chassis was not made for this set of tubes and that the holes needed to be enlarged. The type of the converter tube, as well as the one of the IF amplifier and of the rectifier, was not readable anymore and it has been guessed by the way that the connections were made and by the popularity of tube combination. If one tries searching with Google for this precise string, they will find tons of Italian radios from the late 1940s. Here the cleaning process has already started. At this initial stage, an oven degreaser is used to remove the surface dirt.
After the initial cleaning, the circuit is analyzed and written down on a draft schematic diagram, beginning with a simplified representation of the antenna and oscillator coils based on the converter tube general documentation. Then the process of dismantling can start, but always double checking the draft schematic diagram keeping the old components in case of later doubts, and also writing down the map of the components found under the chassis. The following clips summarize the whole dismantling process up to a bare chassis and should be self-explanatory. The iron parts needed to be cleaned from rust and consequently also from the original protective paint. They were submerged in water to which some muriatic acid was also added less than 10 percent compared to the volume of water. The muriatic acid used was bought at a regular supermarket where it is sold for domestic cleaning purposes. Please notice that this process must take place outdoors, otherwise the vapors would affect all the iron parts exposed in the same closed environment, causing them to rust. Please also notice that the aluminum parts should not be treated with acid, otherwise they would get destroyed. It was time to say goodbye to the unknown logo at the bottom of the dial panel. After a couple of days the parts were extracted from the acid and soaked in water to get rid of the acid residues and were cleaned using brass brushes, removing the paint and the rust.
Each piece was dried and immediately sprayed with a zinc paint. Some other parts, including the aluminum IF transformer shields, have been painted with some type of red that should get along well with the color of the tubes. The power transformer is opened to check its condition and to do some cleaning. An attempt is made to clean the shells with alcohol. Another attempt is made using a degreaser. Once it is verified that the shells are made of iron, they are simply added to the acid bath described in the previous section. The original wire insulation has become too hard, harder than the wires that it contains, which makes the wires vulnerable. Therefore, it is replaced using some heat shrink pipe choosing appropriate different colors. The wires are also labeled, joining them in their different output groups. The primary winding wires are re-insulated in the same way, but only two inputs will be connected, 0 and 220 volts. Therefore, it is important to make sure that the other wires that are in couples are properly soldered together. When the wire re-insulation process is finished, the transformer is tested with great care to avoid electrocution, showing a slightly higher output voltage than expected. Here are visible the 6.3 volts used for the filaments and the high voltage that will be rectified to obtain the B+. Also the filament voltage for the rectifier tube seems slightly higher than expected. After the test, the visible external surface of the laminated core package is black painted, while in the meantime also the shells have been cleaned using acid and painted again. Some cardboard is used to ensure extra insulation between the shells and the wires while new and matching screws are used to hold together the shells to the laminated core package. The primary winding connections that are not used are left hiding inside the shell. This radio is equipped with an unnamed RF module for two bands, medium wave and short wave. According to the dial scale, the two bands should cover between 190 to 580 meters and 16 to 52 meters. As already mentioned, with the help of the people in the forum Electroni al Tramonto, Electroni da Salvara, it was possible to determine that this module should be a Geloso 1903 or a similar one. In fact, it cannot be a genuine component, because it has been built without respecting the precise measurements required to fit correctly into standard chassis. This picture offers a comparison between a genuine Geloso 1902 and the item found in the radio.
About the latter, one should notice the inaccurate work on the small brass panel. It is possible that the item found in the radio was built from separate components, or from a kit, without the availability of an already made brass panel. It might be interesting to observe that inside the chassis of the Italian Radio Hertz 510, there is an identical RF module but branded Delta. The module contained in the radio under restoration has been reverse engineered and compared to the Geloso modules. The differences are the arrangement in the antenna section and the sequence of the trimmer capacitors. While doing the alignment, it was noticed that the trimmer capacitors had an insufficient maximum capacity and that they also had the tendency to short. In the end, the trimmer capacitors have all been decommissioned, using just fixed value capacitors made at Hock, for a reasonable alignment with the dial scale, although not perfect. All the original fixed capacitors have also been changed with surface mount NP0s installed using very small boards. Just for the fun of it, here is the test of the original disk capacitor connected to the antenna coil. It looks like a resistor of less than 400 kilo ohms. In the end, another interesting fact emerged. In the original arrangement of the radio under restoration, the connection to the RF module in the oscillator section were reversed. The dial glass of this radio is installed on a dial panel, somehow standardized in Italy at that time. As an example, this is an advert showing a similar dial panel appearing in the magazine L'Antenne in July 1951. Apparently it was sold already streamed. The panel on the radio has a distinctive manufacturer logo unfortunately that has not been identified yet. The dial glass must have been bought together with the dial panel but compatible with the band selector module. The printing on the dial glass was in precarious condition therefore it was cleaned without even removing the dust where it was unnecessary and then it was sprayed with a clear lacquer to stabilize it. Later, when the clear lacquer was dry, it was sprayed with black paint around the borders using appropriate masking. These are the steps. Here is the final result. As usual, a clearer picture of this dial glass is available in the written documentation that comes along with this video. The intermediate frequency transformers of this radio have the same pin numbering used by Geloso. They can be easily installed on Geloso chassis, but they are not a Geloso product. They seem instead made by Vega BP Radio. This is an advert appeared in the magazine L'Antenne, edition February March 1948. Initially, the IEF transformers have been cleaned. The dirt found on the chassis surface reached also into the IEF cans from the small hole on top. Then they have been polished and then also painted to match with the other components. However, later it has been necessary to grind the holes on top of the cans to allow also the partial extraction of the ferrite core while doing the alignment, which otherwise was impossible. Unfortunately, one core was damaged during an early alignment test, but it has been repaired using the head of a nylon screw attached with super glue.
The core is now operational again. The IEF transformers could not align correctly with the original MICA capacitors installed. For this restoration, it was preferred to just remove the original ones and put new capacitors from under the chassis. Trying first with ceramic capacitors to find the best values, and then using surface mount and P0s, adapted on small boards. Here are the final values installed. After soaking in acid, the chassis has been cleaned and then sprayed with a zinc paint. This was also the original condition of this chassis that came out of the factory with the same simple treatment. In the original construction of this radio, there were no direct soldering points on the chassis but only a few anchors attached with screws. With a non-galvanized, thick iron chassis, it is a good idea to prepare more comfortable ground connection options before rebuilding the radio using some copper wire like in this clip. However, there is one thing to observe. If the surface is iron like in this case, and the soldering points are relatively small, it is not advisable to use the solder alloy containing bismuth because the solder applied will be rigid and it will come off with any small stress, including vibrations. The alloy containing bismuth would work well only on properly galvanized iron, because the zinc ductility would compensate for the rigidity of the solder points. After the zinc paint, one might want to put a different color on top of the chassis, but if this is the case, the additional paint should be applied after having prepared the ground copper network. This is necessary because the paint would not stand the temperature while soldering directly on the chassis and it would get ruined requiring an additional application. This chassis was not made for European side contact tubes also known as transcontinental. The sockets for this type of tube require larger holes and it should be installed from above the chassis. In this radio, instead the tube sockets were installed from under the chassis with only some minor adaptation. Considering the precarious condition of the original tube sockets, it was planned to replace all of them with new ones, also trying to install them from under the chassis. Nevertheless, that required some more minor adaptation to the chassis. However, the sockets installed under the chassis make it very difficult to put and remove the tubes because they need to be tilted, and the extra space taken by the iron sheet of the chassis is in the way impeding this operation. The sockets easily break if they are under the chassis. That happened twice in the initial installation attempt, and in fact, also one of the original sockets was already broken and repaired. So the plan changed into enlarging the holes for installing the sockets from above the chassis as they should. While putting the tube sockets in place, also some rubber suspensions were added after the concern that the sockets could break again. This rubber is probably useless, but it does not harm either. Inside some of the original sockets, there was a piece of cardboard used to lift a little bit the base of the tubes from the bottom, probably to allow an easier extraction. Based on the fragile condition of the tubes, it seemed appropriate to do the same also with the new sockets, 
but this time using the rubber from an old bicycle inner tube. This is a demonstration on how the tubes should be extracted from and consequently also inserted in the sockets. The tubes need to be tilted, therefore the chassis should also be organized so that the movement could be possible without touching anything else around. Unfortunately, in this adapted chassis, the rectifier tube, as well as the final amplifier, which are also larger and taller than the others, cannot be tilted at all, and their safe extraction could be difficult. Here is the example of what would be needed to extract the final amplifier tube. From under the chassis with a thin screwdriver one hand pushes, while from above the chassis the other hand holds and keeps control of the movement of the tube. The small patches of rubber are useful in this case to soften the contact between the screwdriver and the tube base. A plate is prepared to cover the large chassis holes that are not used in the planned restoration. The largest hole is the one that was formerly the place for the input voltage selector, which will not be installed again. Other two holes are also there, and in this radio they were already left unused. This is a pure zinc plate, one millimeter thick, which can be worked easily with hand tools. This plate also becomes a convenient place for installing a loudspeaker connector and two fuse holders, something that was completely missing in the original radio. The fuse holders are secured with super glue to make sure that they will not turn while inserting or removing a fuse. The plate is installed from inside the chassis using small screws, spring washers and nuts. Like in other projects, also in this radio three halogen light bulbs are added to drop some voltage from the input power because the mains provides in Europe about 230 volts AC while this radio was made for maximum 220. Otherwise, the tube filaments would be powered with an excessive voltage, which would significantly reduce their life. The sockets for the three light bulbs connected in parallel are installed on top of a small plastic box, which is put on the chassis on a free area near the power transformer. The power cord, like in other projects, is installed securing it with zip ties and super glue. Safety Y capacitors are used between the two input lines and the chassis ground, which is also connected to the external electrical ground. This power transformer was made precisely for this type of chassis and it is fixed on it bending metal flaps from its shells. Even though the positive output voltage from the rectifier tube is about 300 volts during normal operation, this rectifier immediately provides the B+, before the rest of the radio is able to draw current from it. Therefore, there is a voltage surge, which goes beyond 450 volts. The original filter capacitor seems to have witnessed this issue, with some severe deterioration. Therefore, capacitors rated 450 volts are not sufficient for filtering the B+, and two in series instead of one are put in place. 
For this, a small board is prepared and installed under the chassis using a standoff. Later, with the early tests of the chassis, it is noticed that the rectifier tube is dropping too much voltage from the B+, and a solid-state replacement is made leaving the rectifier tube in place, but with the filament disconnected. This also will take place in a small board installed under the chassis. This radio came with a Ducati variable capacitor with a slightly higher capacity than what would be prescribed by the band selector module. Therefore, the radio cannot be aligned perfectly to the dial scale. Like everything else, it was filthy and it was washed in the dishwasher a couple of times together with other parts of the radio. After drying and relubricating the component, some wall paint splashes emerged. Clearly the radio was exposed to paint splashes that also reached other areas outside and inside the cabinet. The variable capacitor armature is made of a cast alloy that now shows stress. Unfortunately, eventually it will crumble. The variable capacitor was installed adapting the chassis, although more adaptation has been necessary during the restoration. While mounting it again on the chassis, it appeared that the original spacers were too short, because only with them, the variable capacitor drum would brush the volume potentiometer. So taller spacers are used together with new and longer screws, and the terminals are extended to reach under the chassis as before. This radio is made with Philips Minowatt European tubes, with side contacts on their base and generally shielded with a conductive red paint. Their base is also known as transcontinental. This is only an example picture coming from an auction on eBay. In Italy, at the time in which they were used, there was a tax witnessed by a stamp that had to remain attached to the body of the tube. There was an exemption for military equipment, so we know that the converter tube came from a dismantled Italian military device. These tubes are inserted and extracted, tilting their body. Therefore, the glass bulb must be firmly attached to their base otherwise this operation would break them, hence the reason for often finding them taped to their base. In this radio, the IF amplifier is one of those taped tubes requiring some super glue to fix the base properly. Considering that it wasn't possible to bring back the tubes to their original shiny red, later they have been masked and then painted. Obviously, the original stamps have been preserved. If the tubes are painted later, one should have a way to identify them again. And it is also important to write the tube type back. Restoring a radio with this type of tubes, one should make sure that the contacts can actually make a good connection with the socket, and also that they are well electrically linked with the tube elements. For this radio, all the tube bases have been resoldered, and also some solder has been attached to the tips of the contacts. The radio has two potentiometers, one for the volume control, the other one for switching the radio on and off, that very likely was meant to be a tone control. However, at its initial condition before the restoration, the tone function was completely missing in the radio.
The two potentiometers are inspected, cleaned and mounted again, directly on the front panel. Later, the tone control function is re-enabled in the radio. The dial panel of the radio is, for its time, a standardized type with tuning flywheel and variable capacitor drum already included that could fit on Geloso chassis or compatible ones. It was made for four controls, band selection, tuning volume and tone. The volume and tone potentiometers were expected to be in the middle mounted directly on the dial panel while the chassis had two big holes for connecting to them. The dial cord was expected to be made of steel. The one found in the radio was even soldered to the dial pointer. In the original radio, all the screws and nuts were unmatching. While rebuilding the dial panel, except for those that have special purposes, and that came with the dial panel, new matching screws and nuts have been used. Initially, the original dial cord was used because it was still intact. However, there was a problem with the flywheel shaft being very thin and not making enough friction, requiring too many turns around it and too much tension on the cord. That original cord broke and a new one has been installed, but only after adapting the flywheel so that it could operate on a larger diameter with better friction. The adaptation was made wrapping some tinted copper wire around the portion of the shaft that was interested by the dial cord, covering it with a piece of transparent heat shrink pipe later glued with super glue. Here are visible four turns of the dial cord around this adapted shaft. The new wire is stainless steel and it cannot be soldered. Therefore, some super glue is used to secure the knot. Mounting the dial panel on the chassis is not so straightforward. These clips show an attempt that later had to be repeated because the dial cord was too tense. In fact, the drum must be pushed down to be inserted on the variable capacitor shaft increasing the tension on the cord, which must be calculated in advance. Some red heat shrink pipe is used to make the dial pointer red again, and a piece of tinted copper wire is soldered so that it could be wrapped around the dial cord because it is not possible to solder the new steel cord directly to the pointer. If the dial pointer is installed correctly, it must be able to travel the whole width of the dial scale. The original pilot light sockets were severely deteriorated and a decent replacement was not available for the restoration. Therefore, automotive bayonet sockets have been adapted instead, soldering them to the dial panel. Having fixed sockets makes the insertion and extraction of the light bulbs more difficult.
Therefore, if original style sockets are available, they should be the preferred choice. The selected band appears on the dial glass from a small sliding tag pulled by a dedicated cord. The dial glass is held and pushed on the front panel by two brackets, and it sits on thick rubber that here has been made by cutting an eraser. Some heat shrink pipe is glued to the brackets to avoid the direct contact between iron and glass. The original output transformer of this radio arrived with an open primary winding. To test the development of the radio reconstruction in place of the field coil and output transformer, some dummy resistors have been put in place and the audio has been obtained with the help of a signal tracer. This test has been recorded after having done the IF alignment and also the dial scale alignment using fixed value capacitors as described in the section about the RF module. From the early tests, the radio appears to have a poor sensitivity that obliges to keep the volume to the maximum level, which unfortunately will be confirmed later when a new output transformer will be installed. After having verified that the radio can return to be operational, a replacement for the output transformer is ordered and the work on the loudspeaker can begin. The cone is removed from the body of the magnet. That requires removing three bolts with great care to avoid damaging the cone or the speaker coil. Also, the body containing the field coil magnet is disassembled. The field coil is extracted and put aside so that the iron can be cleaned from rust. This iron was galvanized, but some rust managed to emerge anyway. Because there is still some zinc on the surface, it is not advisable to let it soak in acid, because that would remove that zinc. Therefore, the rust is cleaned, first sanding it, and then using some rust remover gel. The rust remover is applied, then washed with alcohol, repeating this process a few times.
In the end, the iron parts are masked, also covering the threads, with cotton and inserting screws, so that some zinc paint could be applied without later troubles. The speaker cone suffered damage sometime in the past, probably in the occasion of the accident that perforated the grill cloth. The glue that is used was tested on paper during a couple of weeks, verifying that it would remain elastic when it is completely cured. A piece of tea bag is used as a patch, adding more glue on top of it. The same is done on the other side. The field coil is inspected, cleaned and new wires are connected to its terminals. The loudspeaker basket is cleaned and some masking paper is inserted to protect the cone and the speaker coil. Then the basket and the other iron parts are sprayed with zinc paint. New wires are connected to the speaker coil. The hole inside which the speaker coil has to be inserted is sanded to remove any residues that might impede its movement. The field coil is inserted in its proper place. The black piece of plastic comes from a heat shrink pipe and has the purpose of keeping the wires isolated from the copper ring that then is pushed on top. An eraser is cut to obtain three rubber spacers that are used to keep the field coil pushed down. The original rubber spacers are now hard as pebbles. The plate on top must be perfectly aligned with the central pole piece. Connecting the magnet body to the basket is the most delicate part of the loudspeaker restoration. The washers have been glued to make sure that they would not move while doing the job, and the rubber spacers are put there only temporarily to let the basket sit on top with the bolts already inserted in their correct place. The three bolts have been replaced with new ones having a smaller head so that a smaller wrench could be used for the purpose of not hurting the cone in the process. When the bolts have been only finger tightened, the rubber spacers can be removed and the bolts can be finger tightened further. While the basket still feels slightly loose, some paper is inserted between the speaker coil and the pole piece to align them. Also some thin pieces of plastic might be used, but very gently, because the body of the speaker coil is very fragile and it could break very easily. However, the clip does not show that at this stage it is necessary to put the screw back in the middle of the cone.
The bolts are then tightened a little bit more with the wrench, but not too much yet, because the proper alignment of the speaker coil must be verified before the final tightening. The cabinet is made of wood but except for the front panel, it seems to come from the recovery of used wooden boxes. For example, this small panel that supports the right side of the chassis has still part of a word printed on it. Leaving aside unlikely contents, the word could be tabanki, which would have made it a box of different grades of tobacco. One might notice also that the side panels are probably too thin for the size and the weight of the radio. This clip shows the removal of the speaker panel. Even though the wood came from old boxes, the veneer is thick and worth preserving. After having cleaned the cabinet, some glue is applied under the veneer that is detached. The veneer is kept wet while pressing it with clamps with the attempt to straighten it. After a couple of days the process will be repeated but clamping on a dry veneer. Even though the panels have been connected using dovetail joints, it seems appropriate to strengthen the structure putting small corner blocks where possible. These new wood elements will be useful also to hold a safety back panel, which the radio never had before. Later the areas without veneer are filled with some wood filler that should then be stained with a brown marker. However, it would have been much better using a wood filler already of a darker color. This is the example of the treatment that all the external surfaces of the cabinet received. First, some acetone has been used to clean the surface from any kind of dirt, brushing with some extra fine steel wool. Then, the wood filler has been used where necessary. Then, the surfaces have been sanded with 220 grit sandpaper, but without stripping completely the old lacquer. Then, the stain has been applied. Finally, some clear lacquer has been sprayed. The speaker panel came off from the cabinet in pieces. Therefore, it was necessary to glue it, which was done by adding the surface of some corrugated cardboard. For the aesthetic, but also as an extra protection for the speaker cone, an internal grill cloth is glued over the cardboard making it invisible while looking from the back of the cabinet. The holes for the screws that will hold the loudspeaker are opened through the fabric using a soldering iron. But new screws are used. They are glued to the panel so that they cannot move when the loudspeaker is mounted. On the original grill cloth that was also washed to see if it was recoverable, it is barely visible that it used to have a floral pattern. The new fabric that will take its place is also about the same subject.
Later, the panel with the new grill cloth is installed again in the cabinet. The next component that is ready to be installed in the cabinet is the wooden frame that stays in front of the chassis against the dial glass. However, later some adaptation will be needed. Also, the piece of wood that lifts the chassis in the middle of the cabinet is installed again. It has now an additional piece of timber attached to it that will be used to catch the back panel that later will be made for the cabinet. Unfortunately, the holes originally made on the wooden frame for the shafts were not aligned correctly and most of the shafts are very difficult to turn once the chassis is installed again. This has been true since the beginning of the life of this radio with the consequences that are visible in the way that the knobs have been handled. Therefore, the holes are adapted to let the necessary space to the shafts. Later, also some felt is added to close a gap that otherwise would let dirt and involuntary trash get inside the radio from the front panel. These clips show the process of putting back in the cabinet the loudspeaker and the chassis. However, the chassis and the loudspeaker went in and out of the chassis several times because it was necessary to work again on the chassis to fix the issues that continued to emerge for quite a while. Later the connections around the loudspeaker will be insulated considering that they carry high voltage. It is possible to notice that the antenna connection was replaced with simple plugs but later they will also be replaced using longer ones for making them accessible from outside the back panel. To keep the chassis at the right place, two stoppers are made using round spacers and long screws. Originally, only two small screws were used for the purpose. The back panel was made using a thin iron net, on top of which some washers have been soldered, where the screws had to be inserted. Also a couple of holes were made for accessing the antenna plugs and for the power cord. Some solder was used to make a harder frame around them for protecting fingers from getting entangled with the net. The knobs were partly broken, very likely because turning some shafts of the radio was very hard and required putting significant pressure on the knobs to do that. Luckily, one of the knobs was still intact and here it is used to make a mold with aluminum foil. The knob to be repaired is prepared, removing the original set screw and cleaning the space inside. The knob to be prepared is inserted in the mold, paying attention to the correct orientation. A hole is made on the mold on the position of the set screw that could not be done before while preparing the mold with the good knob because the position of the set screw was not oriented in the same way.
A toothpick is inserted to protect the thread for the set screw and to guide a piece of pipe that is used to keep the space necessary later to insert the screw. The black pipe used here is a piece of heat shrink pipe already shrunk. But in place of the toothpick, it would have been much better to use a longer but compatible screw with the same thread. Then some hot glue is inserted into the cavity of the knob, also taking the shape of the mold where a piece is missing. The excesses are cut once the glue becomes solid. The toothpick and the black pipe are removed. Unfortunately, the mold cannot be reused for the other knobs, and a new one for each of them should be made. Finally, the bottom of the knobs is sanded to make it flat, and then they are painted. The result is not perfect, but good enough compared to the expectations. This is the original schematic diagram obtained by reverse engineering the circuit of the radio, including the RAF module. Initially, except for some safety changes, that was reproduced as close as possible to the original. However, there was an internal oscillation in the audio preamplifier section. Therefore, the radio was modified adding a capacitor to stop the oscillation and also removing the feedback between the final amplifier tube and the preamplifier. In the meantime, also the connection of the RAF module was corrected and the module itself was modified for getting an alignment using only fixed value capacitors. But at this stage, the value of the capacitors used for the intermediate frequency transformers were wrong, making the radio very poorly sensitive. Therefore, the radio underwent another modification phase with the purpose of increasing the sensitivity, and only later the problem with the IF transformers was discovered and corrected. About that, I am grateful for the support that I received from the people in the forum already mentioned in this video because sometimes there are things that we don't see when the habit is stronger than our ability to look at the obvious. The IF alignment has been done with a signal generator capable of producing only a non-modulated signal at 467 kilohertz coupled with the input grid of the converter tube while the band selector was switched to the medium wave band and the variable capacitor was completely meshed. The negative voltage at the conjunction between R10 and R11 has been read with a voltmeter. The cores of the IEF transformers have been adjusted to get the most negative reading on the voltmeter, reducing the level of the signal from the generator to as low as possible for achieving the alignment. After this procedure, the frequency generator has been configured to produce a sweeping signal between 457 and 477 kilohertz each second. Reading the negative voltage with a digital oscilloscope in place of the voltmeter. The IEF cores have been adjusted to get the lower peak. The most negative value obtaining an upside down bell curve as symmetric as possible. Finally, considering that the cores were loose, they have been sealed with a drop of wax from a tea light using a small brush.
the RF module or band switch selector module, is build reproducing a Geloso component that is described in the Geloso Bulletin number 2829, year 1938, page 37. In the same document, at page 13 and 14, there is the description of the alignment procedure. The RF module of this radio has been built changing the position of some trimmers, but keeping the same behavior, and the description that follows is related only to the module used by this radio. For the medium wave band, the second trimmer is used to align the oscillator when the dial pointer is set to 210 meters. The fourth trimmer is used to align the antenna input to get the maximum signal with the dial set again to 210 meters. The third trimmer padding is used to align the oscillator when the dial is set to 520 meters. However, there is no padding for the antenna input. Therefore, when the oscillator is padded with the third trimmer, one should also find the better reception around 520 meters on the dial scale, adjusting the padding correspondingly and correcting the position of the dial pointer on the dial cord so that it corresponds to the expected 520 meters. Obviously, the process should be repeated until no more adjustments are needed. In a similar way should proceeds the short wave band alignment, with the exception that a correction or padding trimmer was not installed. Finding that the trimmer capacitors were unreliable and with an insufficient maximum capacity, the alignment has been obtained by experimenting with different values of fixed capacitors, which allowed also to do the padding for the short wave band. The ghost trimmer capacitors drawn in the final schematic diagram mean that they should just be kept completely open. This is the long casualty list of this restoration. The discarded parts are saved like for all the other projects of this series. Here is a final view under the chassis after the restoration. If possible, I like to put a label inside the radio cabinet with the record of the known previous owners. In this case, the chassis also has a provision for adding a little plate, which I decided to put with the name of the maker and the record of the restoration. Like all the common radios of its time, also this one was made for connecting it to a simple wire antenna more or less attached in a stable way. However, nowadays receiving stations in the medium wave band out of the static noise made by electrical appliances has become difficult with a typical indoor antenna. This radio receives fairly well in the medium wave band using a loop antenna with these physical parameters connected with a coaxial cable RG58, while it still prefers a wire antenna for the short wave band. If the coaxial cable is sufficiently long, with this simple trick, one could switch from loop to wire antenna without actually having to change the antenna. The cabinet was made with eight sticks in front of the speaker grill cloth, three of which went lost after all this time. Reproducing the missing sticks required the skills of a well-experienced carpenter who made them in a way that they could be adjusted 
to fit correctly in the original slots. Here are the four new sticks compared to one of the original pieces. The following clips show some moments of the adjustment process. Every piece had to be adapted carefully for its own slot. The insertion of all the sticks is tested before staining them. Then the sticks are numbered to make sure that they will find their own place again later. All the sticks are stained with some red oil. Previously, the original sticks had been cleaned with acetone, brushing them with some steel wool. The sticks are then sprayed with clear lacquer, like the rest of the cabinet already was. Finally, Everything is ready. The test is done in the evening using an indoor wire antenna for the short wave band and a loop antenna for the medium wave band. The test starts with the short wave band. The dial glass is tilted like the whole chassis, as it has always been.
수호 비용을 지출하는 이유는 representante Medium wave band. The radio is back at my cousin's, under the picture of my uncle, who paid for this radio the equivalent of a barrel of wine. I like to think that also my uncle, who was my godfather, would be happy for his godson, seeing his radio back to its original shine. Vittorio Gardlini was born in Gallipoli on March 16, 1922. He was the son of a merchant navy petty officer, who later worked at Treviso Customs. 
When the family was in Treviso, Vittorio studied accounting for four years at the Rick Katie High School until the school year 1937 and 1938, but then he dropped out devoting himself to radios. For this activity, he joined a friend whose name was Pavan, studying together as self-taughts, gaining some experience, and then building radios. Later, Mr. Pavan continued to operate until he opened one of the largest radio and television shops in Treviso, in Trenton Square. Vittorio was in the military in Orvito in 1941 and 1942 as a communications officer and radio operator. After the armistice of Casabile and consequently during the Nazi fascist occupation, Vittorio was forced to go to Villa Margarita Treviso. He had to fix and build radios or other communication equipment. There he met Clara, who later became his wife. She was also recruited to make textile parts for radio and communication equipment. After the war was definitely over, Vittorio was progressively less engaged in repairing and building radios, and this activity ceased completely already in 1955. In fact, around 1950, he was employed at the Land Registry of Treviso. Vittorio died in Treviso on July 23, 1968. According to his son Luigi, Vittorio Gardlini designed the radio cabinets that wanted for his own projects, like the one of this restoration, although the actual construction must have been made by a professional carpenter. This is another radio that Vittorio built, but in this case it is unclear if the cabinet was custom made or reused from another industrial item. Considering that there doesn't seem to have existed a Ducati radio with the same cabinet, the Ducati badge may have been taken from another radio. If you know of other radios built entirely by Vittorio Gardlini, please send me a note. I would be happy to know about them. If you would like to contribute to this project, donating old electronics, old equipment, or old radios in whatever condition they might be, that could be helpful for my next restoration documentation. 